challenge. So Eva Bledek to you as well. All right. So uh, yeah, we're going to begin now. Uh, we're going to talk about a few things today. What's been going on in the accounts? What's going on in the portfolio? And also, we're going to talk about electric vehicles today. My favorite topic. Um, I think everyone is sick and tired of hearing me talk about it, but I really want to just show the statistics so that people understand the larger trend of where the world is going. And also, you know, like last week, we talked about artificial intelligence. These things, these themes are going to be a major part of our lives today. Matthew actually met with someone today who owns a gymnastic studio, but he's a techie guy. And, and he understands that it's going to change his business. It's literally going to change every business in the world. It's going to require a lot of processing power, which requires chips. It's going to require a lot of uh, cloud computing, which means data storage. Uh, and that's going to benefit the likes of Microsoft and Google and Amazon. So it's going to be a vastly different world. Cars are going to be a part of that in terms of the artificial intelligence part of cars or cars driving around themselves. But anyways, I don't want to get too far into it. Let me share my screen and we can begin, okay? All right. All right, let's see if you can hear, see my screen. Fantastic. All right, today is Wednesday, April 10th. And thank you so much for joining us. Please ask questions. We will address them at the end, okay? So the current theme is dominating the investment landscape. It is going to be electric vehicles. That's going to be the discussion today. Uh, the activity over the last two weeks, um, we're generating a lot of premium. Uh, the markets have been pretty good, but today's CPI number did not come in very well, you know? Year-over-year -year inflation in the United States is at 3.5%. The month number was 0.4. What does that mean to us? Who cares? What does that even mean? Well, what that means is the markets were anticipating interest rate cuts. Interest rate cuts are very good for the stock market. Why? Because companies can borrow cheaply. They can reinvest in their business. Uh, when cheap money is available, and think about if you're running a manufacturing plant or you want to expand your operations, well, borrowing money cheap is obviously advantageous. Also, the consumer, if the consumer has higher interest rates, meaning they're paying more for their home in terms of mortgage, paying more for uh, cars, paying more for everyday life, that means they're going to have less money to spend on those very same products that companies are making. So it's a twofold effect for companies. So this higher interest rate for a longer issue is becoming problematic. The Canadian economy is falling apart a lot quicker than the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy seems to be stubbornly high uh, high performing. The Canadian economy is not doing so well. It's falling apart a lot quicker. Uh, a, because we are, uh, our housing market is far more inflated than theirs is, and there's a lot more pressure when mortgage prices go up. Secondly, most, most mortgages are about, you know, five-year mortgages where Americans have 30-year mortgages. And another issue we have is we have low productivity in this country. So we have a lot of issues. So we're probably going to have to cut rates faster than the Americans. They might not even cut this year. It all depends on how featured data comes in. But we're going to have to cut. And what does that do to our currency? That devalues our currency. So if you hold U.S. stock in U.S. dollars, and now you are able to buy more Canadian dollars with those U.S. dollars, that would be a tailwind. That would be a boost to your investments. So please keep that in mind because that is a distinct possibility uh, going into the latter half of the year where you have a decoupling, essentially, of interest rates in Canada and the United States, and therefore the Canadian dollar weakens versus the U.S. So we're also going to talk about some of the metrics in the fund. Money continues to come in on a, on, a, on a very regular basis, and we can't thank you guys enough. And what are we going to look out for the next few weeks? All right, so let's get going. First thing we're talking about here is EVs, all right? So this is electric vehicle sales across Seven years, I believe, here. Seven, uh, eight years here. So 2016, 2020. Now, you can start seeing you know, there's clearly a trend. This is, there's no doubt about this one. There's a clear trend here, okay? Is it perfectly linear? No, but there is a clear trend. Now, globally, you, the global car market is about 100 million cars per year. Okay, That's how many are sold. You can see from here that we're at pro, you know, 14, 13, 14 million as of last year. And this year is expected to go uh, a little bit higher than that as well. The majority of those car sales are in China currently, but you can see every other region is also starting to expand, including Europe, the United States, and the rest of the world. The rest of the world is a big deal. It's just in that little, little segment there, but the rest of the world is a big deal. And this is going to happen. Why? Because it is simply a cheaper mode of transportation. So what happens? 
When you produce more electric vehicles, the cost of the batteries keeps coming down. There are no complex parts in terms of engines and transmissions and exhaust systems and moving parts. So it's far, far cheaper to produce as you bring these prices down. So as more and more electric vehicles are sold, that will be the death nail of gas cars in terms of affordability. BYD in China already has vehicles that are $11,000, $14,000, $15,000 US, US, and they're pretty good. Those same vehicles are going to start being exported. BYD may open a plant in Mexico and start ex exporting to the United States and Canada, also to Europe. Tesla is planning on announcing a $25,000 car, which they produce, which they will hopefully be producing in the second half of next year. So when you get to those price points where you're producing a 20, or you're selling, sorry, a $25,000 US car, your total addressable market, your 10 expands exponentially, expands massively, right? Because right now you're at forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 USD for the cars. And that's still a lot difficult, more difficult for people to afford, especially considering people buy based mainly on interest rates or, or, or monthly payments. So if interest rates remain elevated, it's that much more difficult for people to buy. Now, this is a problem that will be for the foreseeable future until rates are going to come down. So we talked about that. The last reading this morning was not that great. Inflation is remaining stubbornly high. That is going to put price pressure or uh, sorry, uh, pressure on electric vehicle sales. When those interest rates start coming down, electric vehicle sales and other vehicle sales will increase because again, most people buy their cars based on monthly payments. So if you have a car and all of a sudden your interest rates are four or 5% higher, it's difficult for some people to absorb, especially when their mortgage has gone up a lot. So we're gonna see how this plays out this year, uh, but the market is still expected to expand quite drastically. David or Matthew, anything to add here? Um, the only thing I'd add is that, um, uh, well, you focused on the, the impact of interest rates in the short run, there is an unequivocal commitment by um, major uh, uh, global economies, OECD countries, to uh, decarbonize, and therefore um, it's being mandated, the conversion to electric cars. This isn't um, uh, going to be a choice or an option, you know, 10 years from now. You will have to buy an electric vehicle. The issue will be, you know, are hybrids considered uh, acceptable electrical vehicles? So this trend uh, can slow down perhaps because people have to deal with the, the economic reality of the cost of, a, of an EV or electrical vehicle, but it is happening. This is not a choice that we're making in the West. No, it's, ha it's happening mainly just for an economic reason, right? Like if you're a, like a just anecdotally, look at my uh, cousin who just recently bought a Tesla. He commutes from Milton to Markham every day. He said, I save more on gas than the car costs me. And there's a lot of people in that situation. But when this, when the price keeps coming down and it goes to that 25000 US dollar number next year, I would expect this number to explode. But in the meantime, while interest rates remain elevated, it's going to be more difficult. So there could be pressure this year. But the trend seems very clear. All right, let's keep going. So who controls the market? Well, right now, it's BYD and Tesla. Okay, And you can see there's a little bit of Hyundai, Kia. The Germans have a little bit of market share. But the entire market is expected to expand drastically over the next number of years. Tesla's number one. BYD is number two. Now, what's the difference between Tesla and BYD? Well, Tesla is a more upscale in terms of price point. BYD is lower, and it only sells mainly in China. Now, the other car companies, they're moving as fast as they can, but a lot of them now have curtailed their investment because rates are high. So, like, do we want to spend all this money on getting there and stuff? And also, I'm not even sure if they're going to survive. Like, that is my personal opinion, but I don't know if these companies are going to survive. <laughs> and what I mean by that is the likes of Ford and General Motors and the incumbents like Volkswagen. The reason being is because... Tesla and BYD and others have such a head start. They're so far ahead that they can produce a vehicle for far, far less than can a, let's say, a General Motors, right? If you're making a couple million units a year versus 100,000 units a year, obviously you have scale, economies of scale. 
you're making a lot more units. Therefore, it means you're making more batteries, more everything, more engine, more trans, uh, sorry, more uh, motors, uh, more everything. Your cost of production goes down per unit. So it's very difficult for those companies to compete while at the same time watching their uh, internal combustion engine sales fall off a cliff. So they have a twofold problem. One, they have to scale up production of their electric vehicles. But two, their internal combustion engine sales are falling rapidly. So what do you do there? You know, the incumbents are in a really, really tough position. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. My theory is that BYD and Tesla will be one and two. I'm not sure who's going to be one or two. It'll be like a Samsung and Apple type thing, in my opinion. And then number two to number 10 will all be Chinese. That's my, that's my prediction. But again, nobody knows for sure. We'll have to see how this plays out. So that's who currently controls the market. The top 10 countries, uh, the top 10 companies, excuse me, control 65% of the market right now. All right. So a lot here to look at and uh, just want to quickly go over it, okay? There's been a lot of companies saying we're going to scale back on our electric vehicle investment. And the reason is, again, you have elevated interest rates. You have an uncertain environment economically. So you just don't know whether it's something you want to do right now. Ford was planning a $12 billion planned electric vehicle. GM abandoned theirs. And Volkswagen has also canceled $2 billion factory. So you start thinking to yourself, is this EV thing gone? Is it even happening? It's going to happen regardless. These companies, Ford, GM, and Volkswagen, may simply not have the ability to compete. Like I said, when you're not making enough of them, it's very difficult. You're losing money on every single vehicle. For example, the Ford F-150 Lightning. Ford was losing $40,000 per vehicle. How long can you sustain losing $40,000 per vehicle? Because remember, the idea is to make enough of them so you're not losing money. And Tesla experienced the exact same thing when they started. They were losing money on every single vehicle. And they lost a cumulative $10 billion before they finally turned a profit. And they were the market, they were the first really to come to the market. So they had that, they had that, you know, the first mover advantage. And even then, it took them years before they finally broke even, over a decade. It took them over a decade just to break even. Now, does Ford, GM, Volkswagen, you know, Toyota, et cetera, do they have the ability to sustain and do this while not going bankrupt? And that is going to be, you know, seen. Let's see what happens. Uh, but they are scaling back their investments. There's no doubt about that. Now, what are some of the reasons that people are reluctant to buy? Well, unfamiliar with the product. Most people still don't know how it works and they think it's going to, you know, you're going to run out of battery and you get it stranded and stuff. That's all nonsense. Um, once you live with an EV, I have for uh, about three years now, uh, driving my, you know, driving a gas car to me now is, <laughs> I'll give you an analogy. Uh, I'm old, so I remember what flip phones were like or the brick phones of the 90s. And it's like using an iPhone 15 versus using a flip phone from the early 2000s. You're like, what is this thing? Now, they both make phone calls. You can text on both. But one is far more technologically advanced than the other. So they both function. They're just different. And when more and more people become familiar with it, it changes perception. Now, range. Range is another one. But range, again, is not really a major concern. Most drivers drive about 60 kilometers a day. In my car, I get about 450 kilometers. So rarely do I ever have to go to a supercharger, meaning a non-charger at my home. I just charge at home the same way I charge my phone. Come home, plug my car in, got a full charge in the morning. Now, this is a problem for urban centers. If you live at a condo, for example, and your building's not retrofitted, you're going to have an issue. So there's those issues to contend with. But as battery technology gets better and better, the range will go up and the cost will come down. Okay? So... Right now, EVs, you give me about 200 to 500 miles of charge, and that is most plenty for most. Limited charging network is another concern, but that is growing rapidly, right? Like if you guys just, again, this is just anecdotal. We talked about this so many times. Just look with your eyes what you see on the road. Which, what, what do you see happening in the world? Ask yourself a simple question. Do you see more electric cars or less? And they, I think the answer is unequivocally, you see uh, more. You need a charging network for people to adopt this technology. If I want to take a trip somewhere, I want to make sure I'm not going to get stranded. And this is still a concern. It is being alleviated very, very quickly. A new supercharger has opened up to my house. Uh, like, for example, when I bought my Tesla in Mississauga, Ontario, 
there was one supercharger. One. Now there are four. Oakville had zero. Oakville now has two. So the infrastructure is really starting. And, and two, what I mean by is, or four, there might be 10 or 15 or 20 stalls at each one. So there's plenty of charging. So this concern, as the infrastructure builds out, will slowly dissipate. Okay? The more cars, the more charges there'll be. Who controls the entire charging network? Tesla. All major brands have decided that the North American charging standard is the one that they want to use. Tesla controls them all. And Tesla will allow the likes of Ford, and Ford's already using them, General Motors, BMW, Volkswagen, Mercedes. They'll all be using Tesla charging networks. So that'll be another revenue uh, stream for Tesla. They'll start making money on simply charging, which is great. Now, what are some of the concerns? Early adopters have been fulfilled. Um, when this first came out, a lot of people said, I don't mind paying a lot more for a car, you know, because I, I I want the technology. Um, you know, interest rates were lower. I'm okay with this. Now, you have to start moving down the market a bit. You have to start making that if you want wide scale mass adoption, you have to make them super affordable. And think about, you know, and that means purchase price and monthly price, not factory and gas. It has to be very, very affordable. Now, like I said, as the price keeps coming down, and it will, the more you make, the more uh, cheaper it becomes to produce, and those costs hopefully would pass on to consumers. You look at the BYD Dolphin or the Seal, and these cars are like 15 grand US. What happens when they hit North American roads and they hit European roads? What is that going to mean to the likes of Ford and GM? It's going to be a major problem for them. So the early adopters have been fulfilled, but they ha we have to now move down and make it more affordable so that more people can afford it. Now, the more expensive vehicles will sell in greater quantity when interest rates start coming down, but we don't know when that's going to happen. We were anticipating three, four interest rate cuts this year in the U.S. Now, maybe not even one. And that's a problem, right? That's going to issue. So higher interest rates. Battery continues to come down. Like I said, battery costs. There's 4 million charging points around the world. And this number is increasing rapidly. These trends are going to only continue. This is not going to stop anytime soon. Let's take a look at current themes, okay? So we can see, now this is just uh, a, few, a few years ago. Um, how many cars have been sold in a cumulative basis? You can see Tesla's at 6 million. Those 6 million vehicles of Tesla, by the way, are also collecting data. They're the only company collecting data. Why is data important? Data is the gold of the future. So I've taken Matthew and many other people for a drive in my in the full self-drive software. Matthew, maybe you want to chime in on what you thought of that. Um, the more cars you have on the road, and if you have the hardware there, you can start collecting data. That data eventually will have to use a uh, will have to get processed. That processing is done through compute power from the likes of you have to buy a chip from Nvidia or AMD, uh, and they'll you'll take the millions and millions of hours of video and it will go through it. How would a human react to this? What would a human do here? What would a human do there? And then it trains the artificial intelligence in your car to start behaving the way a human driver would based upon all the video input so the more miles that are driven the easier it's going to be so you're starting to see this really starting to ramp up here tesla's at six million b what is at four b uh volkswagen's at four and this is this is to 2030 this is annual sales it's according to bloomberg these are forecasts okay just to show you the internal goals and how much they differ okay tesla's internal goal by 2030 is 20 million vehicles per year Bloomberg has them pegged at six, and so does most of Wall Street. Most of Wall Street has it at four, five, six, seven million vehicles per year. Now, keep in mind, again, the global market is 100 million, okay? So it's saying that, this is Bloomberg saying, but by 2030, Tesla will be, still be the leader. VW will catch up to a large extent. BYD will do quite well. Uh, and then you have your Toyota and Solantis. I, 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 there's a lot of this I disagree with. I cannot see... I don't know even how Solantis survives bankruptcy, but that's, again, my personal opinion. Uh, and you can see here, uh, the market share. Market share is starting to increase, but it's starting to plateau off here because, again, the same things we talked about. The cars are still very expensive. Interest rates are high. People's budgets are stretched. It, they're reluctant to spend money. And that's going to be for the foreseeable future. 
until rates start coming down and the economy starts improving. So, but the trend is still very clear. So nobody but nobody knows what the stock market is going to be doing in the short term. You just don't know. Like I said earlier in the year, we thought we're going to have multiple rate cuts. Now we're down to maybe one, maybe zero in the States. That's going to affect how much people spend. Simple. So there's a clear trend here, okay? And But I want to really reiterate here, the most important thing is not selling cars. This is going to happen. The most important thing is going to be the data that's collected from those cars so that you can eventually sell the software. The software is where the money is. It's not in the manufacturing of the car. In fact, in the future, if I was a betting person, I would think Tesla will sell these cars at cost and sell the software at a much, much higher price. So for example, if a car costs $20,000 to produce, it might sell for 20 grand, but you might wind up paying $100,000 for the software. One of those type of things. Now, I don't know if it'll be that exaggerated, but that's what I think it's going. We'll see what happens, but the trend is pretty clear. Matthew, do you want to give any comments on your full self-drive experience? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the full self-driving experience, you know, you do you do have to uh, admire the technology. You have to also put your trust in something that is not human, um, but it drives very, very well. It navigated the roads. We went on the highway, we went on the side streets. It was about four or five o'clock in the afternoon, so traffic had started a little bit in the suburbs. It navigated it pretty well. Uh, I was generally quite impressed. Um, and, would you trust? Uh, would, you, would, you, would you trust? Uh, would you trust Tesla self-driving, or would you trust your son, your eighteen-year-old son? I, I, okay, so I trust. I trust my driving over the self-driving. I trust your driving over the self-driving, but yeah. I wouldn't trust my son's driving over the self-driving. Yeah, me too. I totally agree. So, so, would, right. it, so it, older it, people and younger people, you know, that that's actually a very viable market to tell you the truth. Uh, but like, I think, I think from this for this issue specifically, I think Omar hit the like. I, I've said this for a long time. The more people think about the, the every car that Tesla sells more is a reason for people to start to continue looking at this company as a car company, but it is not. It is a software company and a data company, um, and you know uh, you, you're seeing the start of that with with all this data being collected and used for self driving. You're also going to you're also seeing that with the with the energy generation storage business becoming a larger part of their uh, overall revenue. Uh, and those are things that are that you don't see as line items on uh, other traditional car manufacturers, right? So Imagine they're detrimental because they're, they're they're chewing up a lot of research and development dollars, right? So your R and D spend is very very high. Yeah, and if if Tesla becomes that company that basically becomes an automotive software company, then so be it. And maybe maybe ten years down the road we have a we have an environment where. Tesla has some cars, but like they're basically shipping software to uh, the other uh, manufacturers. Maybe that's maybe that's what happens in the future, right? And and hey, having having a you know a dozen or so auto manufacturers that are buying software off you as a service every month and then reselling it in under their own brand, maybe that's not a bad business model either, right? Uh, so what would course, you what would you give it, Matthew? Out of what, Matthew, what would you give the driving experience as a, out of ten so far? Like so, I just I give you my two cents, and I want to hear your two cents. I look at my in-laws. My in-laws are they're a little older and they're not uh, their eyesight is not as good anymore. We don't really trust them to drive around. This would be perfect for them. They could just they live in Stony Creek and they want to come to our house in Hamilton. Uh, sorry, Mississauga from Hamilton. It would be very nice if they could just put that thing on and get there and we know they're gonna be safe. That would be nice. Now, what would you give it out of 10 so far? I I think <clears throat> I, I think I'd give it a solid like you know, eight and a half or ten. You do have some, you do have some headwinds there in terms of tricky driving conditions and one-off driving conditions that you know you have to see. Like it, it, it's not, you know, if you said, well, would it have made it back to your house? It's like, well, it needed a little bit of help. Okay, cool. But that's what it looks like when it's free to everyone now. What does that look like in one year's time? Hey, that that's how it gets from that eight point five out of ten on my scale to that potential ten out of ten and. In, in in years to come. Now we're gonna we're gonna talk about what that means and how do they get to that ten out of ten. So I would agree with you. And what about you? You had eight, where are you at? Yeah, I'd say about eight and a half or ten or out of ten so far. I would. Yeah, okay. So on the same page there. Yeah. On the same it's page. not it's not it's not perfect yet. It's not. And why is it not perfect? Okay. The reason it's not perfect is because there's not enough data yet. Tesla's no longer compute constrained. They're, they're, they're they have, they still have a lack of data. 
they have approximately 1 billion miles of data. They're going to need approximately 6 billion miles of data to fully solve this in their, in their estimation. They have 1 billion right now. It took them from 2008 to 2024, April, in fact, to hit 1 billion, okay? But now that they released it to everyone for a free trial, they are accumulating data at the rate of 1 billion miles every 30 to 45 days. So theoretically, they will be at 6 billion miles within 150 to 225 days. So the next few versions that we see of this software, it will be that much better. And when it gets to 10, that's why they're going to be launching the robo taxi business on August 8th. Okay. So it's really interesting to see where it goes, but the future guys simply on economic terms, because it's far cheaper, the future is electric. Okay. Now the second part of it is What's more important, it is going to be the software, the software and the full self-driving. That's the key. That's going to be the moneymaker. Imagine a world where cars are driving around by themselves. No more road fatalities. No more drunks on the road. No more traffic jams. You can work while you're driving. Like David, David lives in Prince Edward County. He commutes to Toronto sometimes. I'm sure David would enjoy just sitting in his vehicle letting the vehicle drive by drive, drive him while he can work or snooze perhaps either would be advantageous now david would you pay a couple hundred bucks a month for a virtual chauffeur uh well let me let me just add a few comments to that i suppose i kind of get that now when my wife drives me but uh <laughs> quite the same uh you know uh, it is autonomous she doesn't listen to me and um it does whatever it wants um has lots of experience and I do trust her her driving, uh, but you know, just to supplement what Omar is talking about, um, what is the purpose of data? Data is very useful because of that other thing that we talk about and have talked about, and that's artificial intelligence, machine learning, or whatever you want to call it. The key to machine learning, um, uh, which is basically object recognition, machine learning, which is what. Um, uh, Tesla is putting in there what, what a self-driving car is. It's, it's recognizing the objects around it. The key to object recognition uh, machine learning is data. Experience, 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 experience. And uh, you can never have enough uh, in, in many ways. And that's why as the uh, penetration uh, by Tesla continues to grow in the marketplace where the number of units grows, as Omar has pointed out, they're collecting data at a phenomenal rate. And at some point, um, the probability uh, of having an accident will be so low relative to the human probability of having an accident that it will only make sense to, um, uh, to use self-driving cars. You know, another way to look at Tesla uh, is kind of like, you know, today, uh, most people can't imagine not having an iPhone or um, whatever. And when you pick up an iPhone, yeah, it does it does something. It allows you to communicate with other people through the traditional phone thing. But it isn't just a phone. Uh, it's really a um, computer experience in a portable device. Well, another way to look at Tesla is that it's really an iPhone on wheels, and uh, everything that you have on an iPhone will be in your Tesla, um, but it's also going to have this ability to take you to places and reason and organize and coordinate itself with other cars, with what's going on in the road, so that we reduce the incidence of fatalities. We reduce, uh, we, have, we have the potential to do something which I can't wait to see in my life and that is when a light goes green, not to sit there and watch every single car driver wait until they get to go. So they first one launches, then the second one, then the third one. And by the time I get it gets to me at the ninth one, the light is turned orange. And what you end up seeing is the last four cars in front of me running the orange light. I can't wait until all the cars are communicating and when that light goes green, the whole train, so to speak, or the whole line of cars moves um, concurrently forward. That is a thousand times more efficient than people. And that is not 
a, a, a science fantasy fact. It's not science fiction. It will happen. Now, may not uh, be something that happens in Prince Edward County since, wow, we're going to need a lot of people to do a lot of driving on the roads here so that it has some uh, data experience. But obviously, it's going to start in the urban centers first. And by the way. Right. That's where start. That's, exactly. that's where most of the economic activity is. And then it will radiate out, just like uh, Rogers and Bell is actually trying to provide 4G, 5G networks in rural parts of uh, Canada, even to this day, even though if you're in the city, you should have access to it. The implementation of technology takes time, but it begins with that initial experiment, then you reach saturation, you achieve economies of scale and scope, and then we wake up, and I don't know exactly when it will be, when we can't even imagine not using a self-driving car. And they'll talk about it kind of like, oh, do you know what a flip phone was? Or explaining to our kids, hey, when I grew up, there were no such things as cell phones. Uh, and in fact, I grew up, what is this? I used to, I used to, I used to <laughs> I know what that is. That's a uh, 3D, um, uh, oh, what do they call them again? This is a uh, camera. No, Pathfinder or Viewfinder or a, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, anyways, it, it will happen. And again, it's going to happen for two reasons, because it makes sense from an efficiency product productivity perspective, and as well because we have no choice as humans on this planet to decarbonize. Yes, I completely agree to David on both fronts. We have no choice but to decarbonize because we want to breathe, breathe some clean air. If you look at some of the most polluted cities in the world, it's mainly from emissions. So just yep. let's say you don't even like electric cars. I think everybody can agree we'd like to breathe some clean air. Secondly, it's going to be cheaper. But don't pay attention too much to how much the car sales are from quarter to quarter and year to year. You can clearly see a trend. Interest rates will affect that. But what you really want to pay attention to is who is collecting the data, as David said. Yep. Data is Data is gold. Data is gold. Data is gold. Correct. Now, only one company has the ability to collect the data. So because how do you collect data? Well, you have to have the hardware there to collect the data. So the car has to be equipped with a bunch of cameras. Then it has to be able to record that. Then it has to be able to process that. Who can do that right now? Only Tesla. Okay, so for someone else to catch up, first you'd have to design a car that has multiple cameras. Then you'd have to result, uh, design an infrastructure where you're capturing the data. Then you have to process the data. How long is it going to take you to get to a billion miles? It took Tesla, you know, from 14 years, 16 years. How long is it going to take another company? So what, as Matthew was saying, I don't think what they're, what, what they're going to wind up doing is if I'm a General Motors or Ford or Mercedes, I'm not going to try this. It'll be way too costly. I won't be as good, so not as many people are going to buy it because I don't think many people are going to say, you know what, I'll go with the, with the second best system. It crashes only a little bit more. No one's going to go for that. You're going to go with the absolute safest system. So what they'll wind up doing, as, as Matthew was saying, in my opinion as well, is you'll just lease this software from the market leader, which is Tesla. So if you're a Mercedes, I'm not going to make my own. I'm just going to lease theirs the same way that they have decided to use Tesla's supercharging network. They figured it's too expensive. We're not going to be able to create our own network. Let's just use theirs. And that is something. So this trend is continuing, but pay attention to the more important trend, which is the software, okay? All right, let's keep going. So activity over the past few weeks, we continue to bring accounts in every day. We had a bunch of money coming in today. Um, lots of accounts opening. We had actually had our first few advisor accounts open, which is great. We've had a couple of them. Um, many, many more on the horizon. If I, uh, I'm sure if I haven't been in touch with you yet, I will be in touch with you very soon. Uh, there are, you know, we have hundreds of people to call in. We cannot thank you guys enough for trusting us with your, uh, you and your family's future. Uh, we intend on, uh, being the best stewards and responsible with your uh, capital. Our money is in here as well. Matthew and I have a ton of money in here as well. Uh, so this is something we truly believe in. We have a passion. Can't thank you enough. And we'll continue on bringing accounts. And now let's take a look at exposure. All right. So 
This fund, the Alpha Fund, is the only one of the three that we've launched so far. The other two will be launched as we have assets coming into them. We've already earmarked a bunch of assets, but we want to wait till we hit sort of critical mass, and then we'll get going. Uh, probably as we as we cross over the ten million dollar mark in the Alpha Fund, which I you know I hope would be in the next month and a half or so, uh, then. We're going to wind up launching the other funds, hopefully shortly thereafter. So look, let's look at the exposure. We got Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, AMD, Meta, Eli Lilly, Taiwan Semiconductor, Nvidia, Airbnb. We've allocated three percent to Bitcoin for all you Bitcoin fans out there. I know you will see you. You love that one. So it went from two percent to three percent. David, would you, would you like to provide your perspective on Bitcoin? Because I know you and we and I discuss it. Um, look, um, there are a number of assets in this world that are strictly supply demand driven. Gold is one of them. Um, you know, there's no, it, it has some industrial use, but for all intents and purposes, um, it's just strictly a, a function of supply and demand. Um, and it represents a potential store of value. Bitcoin is another type of uh, financial instrument that's like that as well. It's supply and demand driven. Uh, and, you know, it has limited applications in terms of moving funds. It's not as efficient as a debit card or um, second generation Ethereum that's coming out, uh, which will probably be third generation. Uh, but it does have a, a store of value as long as everyone agrees that it has value. Uh, it's a little volatile at this point uh, in terms of how it behaves, where it's going, etc. Um, now, I know Omar is very keen at, at, as a uh, as a potential hedge against uh, inflation for the simple reason that uh, as long as we agree it's a store of value and the number of units mathematically are fixed, it, it can be used or viewed as a potential um, uh, hedge against inflation. Um, I'm not so much of a believer of that other than there is a finite number of coins that will be manufactured. It's capped at 22 million, which is supposed to be there in about 15 20, years, 20, if memory serves me correct. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so as long as uh, it uh, people agree that uh, it is a potential store of value and it, it'll it's 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 um, an, it's it's a diversifier within a portfolio yeah. and therefore it should be there. Uh, but because of its volatility, uh, particularly at this point, it shouldn't be a significant portion of a portfolio. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, so as you can see, this this fund is very much thematically fo uh, uh, focused. We're looking at AI, electric vehicles, cloud computing, future robotics. Okay, that's one we're going to talk about in the future as well. Uh, that's the next stage of what's going to happen. And also you have a company like Eli Lilly, which is going to benefit from, as David was saying, a lot of fat people in North America. They have a, a revolution <laughs> drug coming out that's similar to Ozempic, and it seems to be more and more popular uh, we've got the chip manufacturers, not only the designers in AMD and NVIDIA, but we've also got the actual manufacturer. So we believe that this portfolio is extremely well positioned. If this AI and you know electric vehicle play and self-driving, if this all plays out, and we strongly believe it is, then this fund has the ability to do quite well over the years. Okay. Another one that we've recently added is Netflix. Now, I was against Netflix for a long time because I'm like, oh, I don't know how they're going to add new new you know subscribers and then the jake paul mike tyson fight got announced on netflix and you're like i got it they're going to start moving to live sports so it's going to be a smaller allocation for us because it's not one of those revolutionary type companies where it's doing something extremely extraordinary it's just it's going to continually gain market share and i'm sorry gain subscribers but that move to live sports is going to be a big thing because live sports is really the only reason people keep cable around. I still have cable. I'm a dinosaur, but I, I have to watch my Leafs lose in the playoffs. I got to. It has and, to happen. And, and, uh, and the Cowboys lose in January. Don't, and the don't Cowboys forget. lose in January. I, have, I need that. I need that, you know, that, 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 <laughs> that punch in the gut every year. Every year, I think I was well, the Stanley Cup time and first round exit. But you still got to watch it. Now, if that was on Netflix or something else, I wouldn't have that cable. It's the only reason we keep it. Netflix is making a move, and especially these one-off events. You have a 57-year-old fighter in Mike Tyson fighting a 27-year-old in Jake Paul, YouTube star. 
That's something that's going to be the future. Those live events draw big crowds because they're novelty. That's something we haven't seen before. So we've got a bit of Netflix exposure because we believe live events are going to allow them to expand their subscriber base. They're going to benefit more from ads. Moving lower down the chain, sort of offering cheaper subscriptions with ads. Like I said, they're so selling ads. And also incorporating AI into their platform. But it's a small exposure at 2%. The big exposure is mainly Tesla and Microsoft. And then to a lesser extent, then it goes down from there. Eli Lilly, Alphabet. But again, we believe this portfolio is extremely well positioned in the future. All right. So what have we been doing? Uh, this is just a fun code. Don't need to worry about that too much. So uh, we continue to get money in every single day. We had a bunch of money coming in today and we continue to allocate. But remember, VIX has been low since... October 27th, I think it just finally crossed 16 today. Um, we've been above the 100-day moving average for six months now. That happens very rarely, very rarely, okay? So that coinciding with May 5th coming, or you know, with the end of the seasonality, seasonal strong period of time, we are going to make sure we have a lot of cash because there will be a pullback at some point in time, and we want to take advantage of that. But in the meantime, we've generated a lot in premium already. We've already generated 3.7% of the portfolio in premiums, which is very, very nice considering we're writing way out of the money. We're being safe. And why are we being safe? Because VIX is low. We're not going to be super aggressive when VIX is this low. You're not getting paid very well. Now, the, the counter argument to that is, well, it's seasonally strong period of time, but you're not getting paid for it. So we're collecting a lot of premium. We're keeping the duration short at 22 days. But more importantly, we're going to wait for a pullback to be more aggressive. We're writing some covered calls here and there. We're collecting money where we can. We're entering positions. But as the money starts coming in, you know, more and more money starts coming in, we're hoping for a nice little pullback and then be able to, to buy it when prices are getting a little bit cheaper. There's, like I said, you, you know, rarely do you have instances where VIX stays below 16 for six months, where you're above the 100-day moving average for six months. This doesn't happen very often. And remember what Warren Buffett said? I know it's, it's hard. Always remember. When others are fearful, be greedy. And when others are greedy, be fearful. There is a lot of greed in the markets right now. It will turn to fear. We want to take advantage of that fear. And we're going to keep a lot of cash on hand to take advantage of that fear. We're writing fairly out of the money. So we're not very exposed in terms of our actual exposure. Our actual exposure in the stock right now is only at 18%. And actually, because we had a bunch of money coming in uh, this week as well, it's now going to be well below eighteen percent. Uh, yeah, we don't want we don't want to be in any too many long positions when the market is at our top. We want to get into these longer positions as the market pulls back into the uh, summer months, and, and and there's a high likelihood that could happen in, in May, uh, in coinciding with seasonality. Any comments here, Matthew, David? No, I, I think you have to proceed with caution, and you're seeing mixed signals on both sides of the border uh, in, in terms inflation. of inflation prints, right? And inflation, unfortunately, you know, everyone is dog now has an opinion on inflation, and that's irregardless if you have a PhD in economics or, you know, uh, uh, an OSSD, but everyone seems to be an expert. And that's, I think, for the, I think that's actually for the better of, of, uh, of society, because we should, we should understand basic economic functions. Uh, but that being said, it is front and center. It is driving a lot of stuff. And now we're also going into, it's almost like the perfect storm in a, in a certain way. You have uncertainty around um, inf inflation's direction and magnitude, as well as an independent indicator being seasonality, where, you know, the, the whole sell in May and go away. And we've all seen that statistic. Um, and, and, and yet we've also had a super low VIX environment, and which is another independent indicator as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when you see uh, when you see rather independent indicators, it's like, OK, well, you know, how much, it, uh, you know, it, it does kind of tell you to maybe take a second look and see, you know, is there a lot more runway ahead up or are you positioned for a correction? Right. And, you know, all I know is that there will be a correction, but I have no idea when. Uh, but that's what history nobody tells knows. us. And nobody knows nobody when. Knows. Yeah. Nobody knows when, but we know seasonality. Yeah, we know seasonality. So from yeah. my per from my personal uh my personal opinion is that yeah, like things are set up here a little bit to to have a bit of a pullback, and we've be, we've been cautious with that because we are mindful of that. But at the same token, you know, we do have a job to do to allocate funds, and we just do so in a more prudent manner when these types of things uh kind of come to come to surface.
We yeah, it's nice to be story to... come come October. David, anything else there? Yeah. No. Um. You know, um, you tell them what or you tell them when, but never both. Um, that's been the <laughs> mantra of uh, anyone who's ever worked in the brokerage business. Um, I started off life uh, in the institutional uh, side of the business, um, <clears throat> been on trading floors, run on trading floors. Yeah, that's that's the problem is that uh, we know that something's going to happen. Um, we just don't know when. Um and it will. So we have to be cautious. And um, and there's always shocks. Uh, the, another expression that I have is the statistically impossible occurs every four to five years. Uh, so that every time I see Nobel Prize winners announce this is a once in a lifetime event, I feel a need for them to turn in their Nobel Prize in economics and start again because they missed and they know better. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I used to work with someone and they said, well, you know, 2008 Black Swan event, uh, oh, yeah. you know, such and such Black Swan event. And he's like, well, if there's a Black Swan event every two Lots years, is it, is it really a Black Swan event? <laughs> so, uh, Matthew, you and I have seen three of them in our in our investing lifetime already. So how much of a Black Swan is it really? It's not, you know. They're not Black Swans. What it is, is just uh, uh, what's called tail risk uh, from your distribution tables uh, or graphs. Um, and <clears throat> what people missed was the the factors that led to the the conditions necessary for that tail risk to take a life on its own. Uh, you know, from my perspective, the world is awash in information. The problem isn't insu insufficient information. Um, the problem is too much information. We really do struggle with the ability to process it and give proper weight to the information that comes on. Um, so another expression I have is what do you call somebody who writes a, about an event that happened yesterday? A journalist. They're not historians. Uh, you need the proper, you need time to be able to put things into perspective. And that's easy after the fact. Oh, sorry, it's easier after the fact. No, the problem is we have too much information and we can't prioritize, we can't organize, we can't weight it properly. Yeah, and that's why we're keeping the exposure fairly low. We're not, we're not, we're not very much long. Only eighteen percent. Even if we were to get assigned everything right now, we'd still have a ton of cash left over. And we're not going to get assigned everything more than likely because we're fairly out of the money. We're still collecting a decent amount of premium, like we said, we collected three point seven percent already, which has been quite nice. Uh, but we're leaving room just in case the we know the market's going to pull back. How severe is it going to be? When is it going to happen? Who knows. But generally speaking, election years are fairly good years for the market, but there has to be a pullback at some time. We want to take advantage of that. Thank you, David. Uh, so what are we looking out for? Again, like I said, we're, we're ending, we're exiting the strong period of the year. Okay. And that's one of our three tenants investing in seasonality. We know we've been in extreme greed for a while. VIX is low. We have to start looking for a pullback and we should be prepared for it. We were anticipating rate cuts. In quarter two, quarter three of this year, and you start getting worse and worse inflationary data in the United States, and you can see these rate cuts are being pushed back further and further and less and less. We talked to this earlier. It's probably going to happen in Canada quicker. Uh, and then the last thing is the the upcoming U.S. election. That's still in the back burner. It's it's you know the you're gonna if you're Biden, you need a strong economy to be able to win. You're not going to win otherwise. So they're going to have to pull out everything they can. Strong economy, strong stock market. You want that point in time to be good. So people are in a good mood. If interest rates are high, there's a bunch of wars around the world. Things are in chaos. The stock market sucks. You're like, mm, I don't know if I want to vote for this guy. And he knows that. So they have to act accordingly. And that's generally speaking why election years are fairly good years for the market. But we'll have to see. There's macroeconomic factors that overplay uh, the presidential cycle. Any last comments, uh, David and I mean, uh, David and uh, Matthew? Nope, I think we're good on this. You know what? We're, we're doing things in the right way, and we're very happy about how capital is getting allocated here, uh, especially even the time of year. It is not an easy investing or trading environment, uh, but we're navigating these waters, I think, uh, reasonably well here. Um, and yeah, uh, and I, I cannot complain about the about the the growing interest in these products. That's uh, absolutely flattering, and and it's uh, it's nice to see in here. 
Um, and yeah, thank you for your support. And we will talk to you in two weeks. David. No, um, I have nothing to add. And um, <clears throat> yeah, this uh, uh, do not be misled by the immediacy of what goes on in the markets. Always remember that it's the, the most important thing is being there at, in the fullness of time as opposed to worrying about any point in time. Thank you. Agreed. Uh, David Lorian has, uh, has yep. a message. I am. I was thinking about that, and I almost wrote down a little note to say I've got to get back to Lorianne because I've got an or other portfolio, and I needed to um, update something. Um, was, part of the the thing that I was doing for it was a customization, and I wanted to talk about uh, uh, market expectations, and I needed to update that. So, uh, Lorianne, thank you very much for the gentle nudge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fantastic. Thank you guys. We look forward right. to seeing you. Have a, a great couple. day. Have a great Thank day. You. See you guys. Take care.